Well, I hope I'm audible enough and understandable because the question I asked, people didn't seem to get it. So <laughs> I, I hope I have better luck with this. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, uh, I would like to start with a, a vote of thanks to the organizers, actually, because this has been a very enriching experience. Uh, the conference has been great. The talks were great. And the energy is so invigorating. Uh, and also to the Python community, I think it's great to have people developing uh, an already wholesome language. So yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, my talk today is about uh, large-scale extraction, structuring, and matching of data. Even I don't remember that without looking at the heading, to be honest. It's a mouthful. But what I'm really trying to say is this. like, How did we manage to make sense of more than 100 million things uh, at the, work, the workplace that I work in? Uh, my name is uh, Deep Kayal, and let's do a quick introduction of who I am. Um, uh, I work as a machine learning engineer uh, in, in a company called Elsevier uh, in Amsterdam. For all those who you do not, uh, all those of you who do not know Elsevier, it's a, it began a, more than a hundred years ago as a publishing company, but right now it's foraying also into information analytics to derive useful insights of scientific articles to help people in, for example, healthcare and education uh, by. I don't know, giving them pairs between diseases and drugs, which have occurred simultaneously in scientific literature, so that doctors know if they're treating you for an illness, what are the possible drugs that the, they can give you. For that, we need a huge pile of data to derive those insights out of. Um, and as any information analytics company would have it, uh, everything that we do relies on data. So sometimes when you work with data, you have problems uh, where you have a ton of unpreprocessed, unstructured data, and you're trying to essentially make sense of it. Uh, sometimes you have this problem, which is commonly known in literature as record linkage, um, where you have uh, one, uh, one uh, sort of production quality database, uh, your good data, and one data dump. Uh, which is like a pile of data someone hand delivered to you which you had no control over and which you kind of want to make sense of. Uh, we had the same problem and we keep having the same problem um, sort of repeatedly because we want to enrich our production data as much as possible. Uh, and as data quality improves over time, such enrichments will continue to happen. And I'm, I'm sure uh, for all those out here who work in the data industry, it's the same for you. So, so the, the problem was this. We, we specifically had uh, many hive tables where we had um, extracted relevant stuff from scientific papers, mostly bibliographic information like a title or an abstract, like a publication year, uh, a DOI. A DOI, if you don't know, is a digital object identifier, which is like a primary key for scientific uh, publications. It's, like, it's mostly one-to-one. -one. Not always, but, most, but mostly. So this is our sort of good data. We know exactly how it looks like, but the quality, of course, is still improving over time. And then we also had um, a, a data dump, so as to say, which was all over the place, to be honest, because we had no control over it. Uh, it, it, uh, it was delivered to us and is, is, is still being delivered to us in pieces by third-party vendors, um, and they do their own magic to it. Magic. Uh, uh, and they do all sorts of stuff like recursed uh, zipped archives, PDFs, instead of more structured content and so on. So it, it, we didn't even know what we were looking at. And it was a bigger problem than this because we had uh, over 100 million files to deal with. So it was really hard to sort of uh, have a summarizing inference from, the, from just taking a look at it manually. So when we um, got, when we got uh, this problem to be solved, it was pretty daunting to start with, to be honest, because there were too many things going on at the same time, and, and we didn't really know where to begin. But like all problems, you mustn't really hack through it, uh, although hacker is a fancy term these days. <laughs> but you should deal with stuff more scientifically. You, you, you try to break down the problem into atomic tasks, uh, and you solve them uh, as best as you can for each task, and then you combine them at the end, much like you would do in a divide-and-conquer algorithm. 
In, in our case, the relevant questions were, uh, how do we untangle this mess? Like, how do we realize what's in those archives? Once we do realize what is in the archives, how do we make sense of it and extract any useful information out of it? Like, if we know that the archive has a docx word file, then what can we do about extracting a title from the docx file to, to have uh, matchable and meaningful information? Then, using that information that we just extracted, how can we best match to our production database? And finally, which is a recurring question through, uh, through all of these uh, atomic subtasks, is how do we do it at scale? Because we are talking about tens of millions uh, to hundreds of millions of files. The tech stack, of course, was Python, uh, which was the main sort of programming language, uh, and Spark for processing for the win. Um, Python integrates surprisingly well with Spark, uh, so if you haven't tried it out already for your own problems, please uh, do it, it's, it's really great. So the f to answer the first question of how to sort of make sense of what is in the archives, you, you get, again have to be scientific. Of course, there's no uh, way to generalizably automate such a process. Every uh, compressed archive is inherently different. You can do your best, but it, you can't really pass on, uh, you can pass on the, the, the workflow to other people, but you can't really pass on the code per se because it will not work for everything. But looking at the archives, taking slices of it, looking at manually, uh, or also talking to people who made the archive, if you have access to them, you can make some sort of a well-formulated uh, assumption about the archive, and then you can code it up and then generalize it. That's how you probably code anyway. So our data dump, when we take a, took a look at it, seemed to be uh, sort of nested or recursed, uh, compressed archives. It was zips of zips or zips of gzips and tars and so on. But what was in those zips was mostly um, PDFs uh, or XMLs, as you would expect uh, any uh, most scientific papers to be. Um, so le let's start with a very small example of what I'm really saying. Uh, first, we uh, see how we distribute the data uh, on Spark. If, if, uh, if I don't go into the optimization details right now, uh, it's because it's only 30 minutes, but I'd be happy to talk about it outside this. So let's just assume this command. Uh, if you do a binary files with a Spark context uh, SC, uh, a Spark context, by the way, is how you talk to a Spark cluster. When you initialize a Spark context, it means that you have um, told the resource manager that it should await commands. Uh, so you pass on your sort of uh, magnificent 1000 tar gz files to the Spark cluster via this binary files command. Now Spark is sort of ready for processing these files. The next thing that you need to do is uh, tell uh, Spark what to do. For that, you need Python. So you write these two helper functions. The first function sort of extracts information from it. You see that it takes uh, a, a variable x. Now, when you, when you do the, the previous thing, uh, Spark creates what we know as RDDs, which is essentially a key value pair. So the key is the name of the zip, for example, one dot zip. And the value is the whole binary co content of the file. So here, when you see, uh, you see x is being split into x0 and x1, where x0 is the name of the file, and x1 is actually the whole binary, co the, the byte uh, content of the file. Uh, then you put it through the, your zip and tar and gzip libraries uh, to, to actually get the contents of the file. You, you read in everything that is XML, which is this specific case, but you can choose to do so with other types of content. And then you make a dictionary out of it, which is essentially, again, a key and a value. The key is the path to that particular file within any zip file anywhere. And the value is the whole content of the file dumped uh, in the dictionary. Uh, so now, if you run only the extract on Spark, you would have a list of such dictionaries. But you don't want that, because that's uh, not uh, very parallelizable. You, what you want is actually a list of tuples, like a list of key value pairs. Uh, so you have to flatten the dictionary. And that's what the flatten, flattener function does. Uh, when you have, once you have these functions and you've tested them, you sort of push them through the map function of Spark, which efficiently um, uh, distributes your work. Uh, if you use a map function, it will distribute it to per data point, but there are other functions which distribute more efficiently, but let's not go into that right now. Uh, you call a flat map then to flatten the contents, and then finally you save uh, everything that you did into what is known as a sequence file. Uh, now, a sequence file, if you do not know what it is, is uh, Hadoop's way of uh, efficiently storing data. So instead of storing one file 
uh, one, uh, one unit of information per file. What it does is it stores uh, a massive file with, say, uh, 1,000 files, and another massive file with 1,000 files. And this way, it can effectively distribute all your files into the different nodes and executors that it has. So what you essentially did at the end is you produced this sequence file, which is a key, which is the, um, the, the name of the file, and the value, which is actually the, the whole content. I, I hope you can see it. Um, so you, you achieved your first task of making sense of it all. You, you, in, from, from a mangled mess of data, you, you managed to iron out the contents of the file and actually track it back to its source. Um, then the next problem is uh, how to extract meaningful information out of it all. Um, uh, we, here as well, the approach is the same. You, you have to sort of dig into the data uh, and, and uh, do some sampling and make some assumptions which are general enough for your use case. For our use case, we were trying to um, understand what kind of bibliographic information is in there, uh, meaning titles and abstracts and DOIs and so on. Uh, and we were mostly looking at uh, things which represented um, um, scientific articles, so uh, XML files and PDFs. XMLs are relatively simple because they're structured content anyway. You can just use Python's XML library um, in your own function. But with PDFs, we had a harder time uh, because PDFs aren't really structured. They're, it's an ongoing area of research, actually. Uh, it hasn't been solved yet. There are many such tools which claim to structure PDFs, but none of them work um, with, a, with a gold set accuracy. What we used was this tool called Sermine, uh, which is, I think, by um, a university in Poland, uh, which uh, uses machine learning to effectively check where uh, you have things in a PDF to make sense of it by you know, comparing fonts. So a header is a bigger font, and a section is a smaller font, and so on. And with, with both textual information and these lexical information, it, it kind of makes sense of a PDF and splits it into more structured format. So um, let's, let's um, not go into PDFs for now, because it's a bit more complicated. Let's see what we can do with an XML. Uh, here you have uh, uh, an example XML. It, it, what you need to sort of consider is that you perhaps want to, to extract the title from it. You see that it has the title within a, a tag which conveniently says title. But that's mostly the case with these um, um, well-formed uh, tags because a title of a scientific article can only be called so few things or an abstract of a scientific article can only be called so few things you can quite easily have a few rules which help you extract uh, very general things like a title, an abstract, or a DOI, or a year. It's, of course, much harder to, if you want to extract something like a section or, or figures and so on, but we don't want to do that. What we wanted to extract were more overall metadata information, and that was pretty simple to do. So then you write your own small parser for the title. You use uh, the XML uh, library. You push your uh, XML through that uh, as a string, and you find everything th that is called a title or a citation title. That is what we sort of um, uh, learned when we looked at the data. And most of our cases were covered. With that, you just return it to another function uh, uh, later on. So with this uh, XML, when you pass it through a general parser, which is very easy to write, you get you actually get the title correctly uh, extracted. You write such other parsers um, for, for example, abstract or a DOI or the journal volume, the issue, the the page numbers, uh, and so on, uh, and you put it together in a meta function, which takes in your um, sequence file. So if you remember, the sequence file was a key and a value. The key was the name, the value was the content, and that is exactly what we're doing. The F name is the file name, which is the key, which is X0, and the content, which is actually the whole file itself, is X1. We want to process the content, and that's what we do in all these parsers. Once we have all the processed content back to us, uh, we have to make Spark understand what it's getting back. For that, Spark understands what a row is, a row in a data frame, or a table, essentially. A row is, uh, for us, might be a collection of all these values that you see, uh, file name, DOI, volume, and so on. So you have to tell Spark that, hey, I am expecting a file name at the first, uh, at the first uh, value, uh, value of the row, and a DOI at the second value, a uh, volume at the third, and so on. So you have to sort of create a struct. In, in our case, it's called one row. 
So when you get all your parsed information back, you push it through a one row to make a row that Spark understands with all your information. Finally, uh, you want to do this not just for one file, but your entire uh, repository of everything uh, represented by the sequence file. So you call the sequence file command, uh, which makes an RDD, and then you push uh, your um, parser, parser function through it, which gives you back rows. So once you map, uh, you push your function through the mapper and get it back as a data frame, you have something like that, which is essentially a table of what you wanted. You, you, you have, from very unstructured data, managed to make something realizable. And that's uh, the quick recap here. Uh, we started off with a data dump of everything all over the place. And now we kind of know what we are dealing with. We, we extracted some meaningful information out of it. The, the final task that we had to do, and the most important, I guess, with, without which the whole exercise falls apart, is, is the matching. So how, how to ma match two things? Um, there are many ways to match uh, the approximate matches, exact matches. Uh, joins are a good way to match. Uh, it's a very standard thing to do in SQL. If you have uh, keys which you can trust on, of course. Uh, and approximate matching is something which people do more and more. There are techniques called uh, like locality sensitive hashing or LSH, which is a very popular technique to do approximate matching. But again, let's not go into that because I'm just trying to give you a hint of what you can do with Python and Spark. So let's see, let's see what we can do with only exact matches. Uh, exact matches, as I said, rely a lot on how you pre-process data. So if you have uh, a title which is uh, missing a dot at the end versus which has a dot, if you do a join, you won't see it. So what we have to do is pre-process it um, a little efficiently to avoid such um, uh, negative, false negatives. No, oh, sorry. So the first step for that is to normalize the content. Um, so here we have a quick normalizer which uh, essentially gets, goes, zips through the, the, the title, uh, checks if there are any stop words. Now in natural language processing, there are, there's this notion of a stop word which, is, which are frequently occurring words like if or the or when. So we first get rid of those. Uh, and then we convert, uh, we get rid of all uh, non-alphanumeric characters like dashes or percentages or, or question marks. And then we lowercase everything. So that becomes our match key. So for, with, with that function that we have uh, de defined, uh, we load up the table. Uh, we pa push it through Spark again, uh, telling Spark that please take my title and apply the normalize function on it. On it. This is very similar to pandas. Uh, I think if you if you've used pandas, you know what this uh, what this does. So it will take the title and make another column called norm title, which uh, normalizes your title in the way that you have described. Uh, so if, if you see here, uh, management of acute kidney problems, uh, if you quickly browse the norm title, you see that the off has disappeared because we removed the stop word. Now this is kind of a better matching key than your raw text. The next thing that you do uh, to complete your match is join uh, on different things, uh, followed by unioning everything so that you have one uh, match file. So you join by things like DOI. Of course, you have to check before that that the DOI or any such uh, key on which you're joining is non-empty, because if you join two things which are empty, you'll get tons of false matches. So you join things on, for example, DOI, you join the thing on uh, the normalization of the title that you did, you can similarly normalize the abstract and join on that. All these joins, of course, are inner because you want a one, hopefully one-to-one -one match. You finally uh, do a big union and then you take a distinct because you don't want duplicate rows. So finally, what you have is this uh, nifty little file where you have uh, on one side a PUI. You don't, it's just a primary key that we use. So uh, the primary key of one of your databases. And the other side, you have, for example, the file name to where uh, this, this huge mess of things uh, is located. So the primary key, again, of uh, your messy data dump. So essentially, what you have just managed to do is match everything against everything else. And now it's ready for enriching. So in summary, what we managed to do uh, here was we had some production quality good data. We had a pile of data lying around waiting to be used in enrichment, which we had very little clue about. 
And we managed, in the end, to, to uh, match everything together, what was possible to be matched, uh, and make the match pairs ready for further products to make use of. Uh, we did that by effectively breaking down a huge problem into smaller, uh, more tackleable sub-problems and solving each of the problem by itself with the best of our uh, abilities and approaches. And we did everything using Python and Spark. So that's to, to, to conclude the whole uh, talk about what you can do with Python and Spark over s relatively short uh, fraction of time, uh, just to give you a hint of everything. And, and feel free to reach out to me now or outside or over email uh, on the, the aforementioned address. And we're always looking for people to work for us in, on problems like these and more machine learning oriented and NLP oriented problems at Elsevier. So yeah, th thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Hi, great talk. Uh, am I audible, first of all? Yeah, you are. OK. Um, which version of Spark uh, were you using for this? Uh, it was 2.1. So uh, 2.1 even has LSH that I mentioned, for example. So it, it allows you to do even fl uh, approximate matching flexibly. So yeah, 2.1. If I uh, understood your presentation correctly, you have chosen RDDs over data frames? Um, no, uh, you have to choose RDDs as the first version because data frames assume structured data, right? So we didn't really have CSVs or things like that. We, we had to start off with uh, a, a file, a raw file, which we had no clue about when we started off. So it was a file within, embedded within an, an archive repository. So it was like a file within a zip within a zip. So, so were you able to use the Catalyst optimizer, which uh, directly, sorry? were you able to use the Catalyst optimizer, which directly works on the data frames? And no, no, no. We had to do our own, basically. We had to partition it. Yeah. So that's what I avoided here. We had to chunk those files uh, by, by ourselves and make the memory management ourselves. Yeah, good question, actually. Another question? Um, which library did she? Uh, which library did you use to uh, to use Spark with um, Python? Uh, just PySpark. It's PySpark. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the version. Maybe. I, yeah, I have. I don't remember the okay. version. But PySpark. I think it, it's pretty standard. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how many nodes or slaves do you use in your architecture? How many nodes? Yeah. Uh, I think it was a R uh, X large Amazon cluster with eight. Uh, eight, I think. Eight. Okay, and for beginners, how hard is to set it up, for example? Um, it's maybe a day's worth of work, not very hard, to be honest. To optimize it is a bit harder. Uh, if you want something which you can optimize, yeah, like the memory management which you can optimize very quickly, um, I would suggest starting, uh, starting to read Flink. Have you heard of Apache Flink? That's another side project which has a better memory optimizer. Um. Just a minor comment: When you generated the product UI, um, when you when you generated the product UI, if you could go back to that page, you um, you, you 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 remove the stop words and you, you blast the white space, and you end up with a very long run-on string like management ac acute kidney syndrome. So the yeah yeah uh, yeah why 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 would you choose to not to blast uh, white space into an underscore and then you could you can recover. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, point. I mean, uh, we we actually did much more than this. So sure. we, uh, this was just a quick thing to show you guys. We actually uh, ended up using NLTK to remove even uh, non uh, noun non noun phrases because sure. you know if you have a title, the assumption is that you uh, someone is introducing some novel concept in a title, which is probably not a verb or an ad adjective. Uh, it's it's more probably like a noun phrase. So you might have a title like um, cure for um, uh, I don't know, malaria or something. Uh, and in those cases, um, it's uh, probably useful to remove everything but a noun phrase. 
Um, uh, well, that was a bad example, actually. Uh, in longer titles, it's uh, useful to, what we found was it, it was useful to not just remove stop words, but also remove everything which, is, which wasn't noun phrases. So just keep the nouns. So with, there were many pre-processing uh, things that we did, and we sort of ended up with the, the best one that worked best for us. So this was just uh, an example. But you're, you're completely right. It, that would probably have worked as well. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's also possible to use word vector or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Another good question. Thanks. Are there any other questions? I just wanted to mention to the audience, if they are interested in this, that uh, Py PySpark got released on Python's package index a few days or stuff ago. So you can now in pip install it. And it's pretty recent news. So. Oh, wow. OK. Thanks. Thanks. Um, also to that, couldn't you tell me what kind of reliable reliability you can reach with this type of matching or just in your data in general? Yeah, an another good question. I actually, I avoided numbers here in this presentation because when you, when you give people a, like a, an accuracy, a lot of that depends on the configuration, right? What, how you did stuff and what kind of things you did to validate your results. So uh, I, can, I can mention it here. Um, the throughput that we got was, uh, I think we, we were crunching um, around 70 million files in five hours on a relatively small server with nothing fancy. Um, uh, uh, and we, we got around 50% match rate with just the digital object identifier, which I mentioned was like a primary key for files. Uh, we didn't get more than that because a lot of DOIs were missing in the data dump that we got. Uh, when we added um, titles and abstracts, it was around uh, 76 or 80 uh, percent towards the end. So we could match around 80 percent of uh, the dump that we got to our own data to enrich it. So yeah, uh, is that kind of what you're looking for? Okay. Anybody else? One more. Hi. Uh, Hi. How do you handle multiple languages? I mean, this presentation is with Eng English language, but I assume you have yeah, documents. Yeah, absolutely. In other so um, the short answer is that uh, in XMLs, uh, since it's tag specific, there's a tag, uh, there's a, an attribute of a tag, which is called, which is a language, for example, in most uh, scientific content that comes to us. So you can actually uh, filter a tag out and also see what language it is. So you know, we didn't just extract English. We uh, extracted all the possible languages of things that the XML had, basically, um, uh, before we matched it. So we, we, it was not just English. It was also, and it, it's, it's not, not that complicated, actually. It was relatively simple to infer, given that the data already has uh, uh, the, the attribute in the tag, that lang equals es or en or something like that. We have time for two more questions. Give me a break, guys. <laughs> yeah, so any advantage of using PySpark doing the joins here compared to using a relational database? Um, so I didn't, uh, we didn't really use a relational database because uh, we, we did all of the dumping uh, in Spark, natively in Spark anyway, but we did compare what it would take for a multi-threaded Java program to do this. Um, and it was, the throughput was something like 20,000 files an hour. Uh, it was significantly less. So I mentioned like 70 million files in five hours as opposed to 20,000 files in, and in one hour. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a good thing to try to benchmark it against a database. But as I said, we, we had a pile of data and we, the first thing was to in fact extract information meaningfully out of it into a database and structure it. We didn't even have a database to start with. We had one database, but we didn't really have another one. So, Thank you. Okay. Last quick question. Uh, what is your recommendation for doing a streaming? Oh, Flink, for sure. Uh, as I think I just mentioned this to someone else as well, because par uh, Spark, you said streaming, right? Uh, yeah, so Spark is, I, I guess you know it already, 
but it streams in mini batches. And it, the memory optimizer for Spark is good, but it's still, I, mean, I, I think it's not the best. So um, Flink is an up and coming project of Apache as well, which is actually the other way around when you compare to Spark. Spark streams in small batches, and Flink is a, actually a streaming pipeline which batches in small bits of the stream. And it has a better streaming uh, process, and it has better memory management. So if you want to begin a project um, uh, the proper way, which is a streaming project, try using um, Apache Flink as well. I mean, try uh, reading about and benchmarking Apache Flink. So uh, why not a storm? Or uh, sorry? Why not a storm? Uh, why not uh, use a storm? Uh, Storm, yeah, sure. I, I haven't used it myself, I'm sorry, so I, I don't really have any um, experience of Storm, but it, I have go heard good things about it. So uh, I said Flink because they're kind of, uh, Spark and Flink m might be similar in uh, a few regards, like, I don't know, you can do machine learning on both uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, I haven't really used Storm, so uh, I don't have a benchmark to compare against. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's the whole time you had for questions. So thank you again. For uh, the thanks talk. a lot. Thank you.